Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of City Club, and I welcome you all. Those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB-FM and KBPS AM radio, or watching on cable television. Thank you for joining us for this week's Friday Forum on this, the 6th of March, 2009. Today we will hear from three prominent Oregon judges who will discuss the changes and challenges affecting Oregon's courts. But before we begin our program, I have a few announcements. First, in consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones and any other devices that could make noise. We are pleased to have had four Friday Forum corporate sponsors this quarter, without whose generous financial support these time-honored City of Portland Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our four corporate sponsors for this quarter have been The Standard, UBS, Girding Edlin Development Company, and Pacific Power. Now today is the last Friday of this City Club quarter, so let's give these four sponsors uh, our special appreciation. And if you or your company or agency would like to be a Friday Forum sponsor or a City Club Research Program sponsor, please talk to the club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club offices. You know, the fact is City Club is not immune to the economic pressures we are all facing and the organization needs sustaining sponsors like the four I just mentioned and others providing continuing financial support in order to keep the kind of programming like these Friday Forums that helps keep Portland Portland. And in this vein, please know that City Club's annual membership campaign kicks off this month. So, if you have been considering joining City Club but just haven't gotten around to doing it, this is a great time to join. And if you are a former member who has let your membership lapse, this is the time to do the right thing and renew. Uh, City Club is a membership organization and it cannot and it will not be financially healthy and thus cannot and will not be able to continue our 93 years as playing the key role that we do in the civic infrastructure of this city, region, and state without citizens who join and renew their memberships and frankly pay their membership dues each and every year. So if you can join, please do. If you need to renew, please do. City Club needs your support. Now, as an added bonus, uh, when a new member joins at this time, uh, during our membership campaign and acknowledges that a current member has been the recruiter of their joining, both will receive a uh, voucher for a free lunch here at our Friday Forum series. You can pip, pick up membership brochures at the registration table or go to the City Club's website for more information. On March 25th, City Club Citizens Read Book Group will be discussing the book Dance Lest We, Fall Down, well, Lest we All Fall Down, which chronicles Seattle author Margaret Wilson's efforts with local activists to create a top quality educational center in a Brazilian shantytown. You can purchase this book from AGRA committee member Cynthia Townsend, the back of the room there, Cynthia, uh, after today's program. AGRA has two other events scheduled yet this month. On the 24th, a discussion of primary health care, and on the 26th, a third talk on the subject of human trafficking. You can learn more about these and other City Club programs by reading the club's weekly bulletin or by going to the club's website. We have new, uh, one new member with us today we'd like to recognize. He's Roger Meyer, uh, pediatrician and professor at the University of Washington, a retired colonel of Special Forces based in Oregon. Roger, if you're here, please stand. Welcome. Uh, next week here at Friday Forum, City Club welcomes Dr. Mary King, who is a professor of economics at Portland State, who will address the idea of a sustainable New Deal as a significant policy response to the un unfolding global economic crisis. That's Dr. Mary King from PSU next Friday here at City Club's Friday Forum. <clears throat> and now to today's program. In the American political system, including here in Oregon, our courts play several essential roles. As a judicial system, our courts serve as a check and balance against the abuse of power by the other two branches of our government, the executive and legislative branches. In so doing, our courts protect against violations of citizens' basic rights by the government, including violation of rights of the minority by the majority. 
Our courts also interpret and clarify the meaning of statutes and ordinances and agency rules and regulations. And finally, our courts administer and oversee the prosecution of those accused of committing crimes, as well as the civil trial system, whereby citizens, companies, and organizations peacefully resolve disputes. Now, given all of these critical roles played by our courts, it is very significant that Oregon's judi judicial system has undergone substantial changes and challenges in the last 10 years. The use of private, typically contract-based mediation and arbitration as alternatives to court trials has become widespread. There also now are special mental health courts and drug and alcohol diversion courts, as well as groundbreaking initiatives for at-risk populations such as foster children. At the same time, Oregon's courts have not been immune from the challenges posed by our state's budget shortfall. Indeed, far from it. Just last week, Oregon's Chief Justice Paul DeMunez, who spoke from this podium last year, announced that all state courts will close on Friday starting next Friday, March 13th, as a result of state budget cuts. And I want to mention, though, the Oregon head, a head, Oregonian headline today says, Stimulus Reserves and Cuts Fix Budget. If uh, you turn inside, uh, you will see that uh, the details about our courts say state courts will close every Friday between March 13th and June 30th to save money. Court employees will be further furloughed during the closures. The closures will affect circuit court, tax court, the Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court. So uh, the budget may be fixed, but it's not fixed as to our courts. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that today because we are pleased to have uh, th three uh, leading judges from our court system uh, who by their uh, collective presence here represent yet another change that's going on in our courts, which is the growing presence and leadership of women judges. Our first speaker is Judge Ellen Rosenblum of the Oregon Court of Appeals. Uh, before becoming a judge, Ellen Rosenblum was a lawyer in private practice in Eugene and then served eight years as a federal prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Eugene and Portland. She next served as a judge in Multnomah County for 16 years before joining the Oregon Court of Appeals in 2005. Uh, judge Rosenblum grew up primarily in Evanston, Illinois. She has a B.A. In, in Sociology from the University of Oregon and is a graduate of the University of Oregon School of Law. Our second speaker is uh, Judge Jean Maurer, and Judge, I want you to know the note said it rhymes with power. On a good day. She is the presiding judge of Multnomah County Circuit Court. Before becoming a judge, Jean Maurer was a prosecutor in the District Attorney's Office of Marion County and later Multnomah County. She then entered private practice uh, and after eight years returned to being a prosecutor in Multnomah County. She was appointed a judge in Multnomah County in 1996, and in 2008, Judge Maurer became the first woman to serve as presiding judge of Multnomah County Circuit Court. Uh, she grew up in the small town of Hanford in the San Joaquin Valley in Central California, uh, received her BA in history at UC Berkeley, and is a graduate of Santa Clara Law School. Our final speaker is Judge Nan Waller, Chief Family Court Judge in Multnomah County. Before she became a judge, Nan Waller initially worked as a lawyer as, uh, in legal services in Montana and then uh, in the Metropolitan Public Defender's Office in Portland. She then became a half-time juvenile court referee in Multnomah County for 12 years until she was appointed a judge in Multnomah County Circuit Court in 2001. Judge Waller grew up in Portland, a graduate of Lincoln High School, for those who want to know, received her BA in sociology, although she tells me it was more complicated than that, from Stanford, and also is a graduate of the University of Oregon School of Law. Now our three guests will speak in the order in which I've introduced them. We have asked each of them to talk approximately 10 minutes for a total of 30, uh, with the idea that we'll have at least 15 minutes at the end for question and answers before we adjourn promptly at 1.15. So please give, uh, help me give a warm City Club welcome to all three of today's speakers, the first of whom will be the Honorable Judge Ellen Rosenblum. Thank you very much, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to begin by acknowledging my very first judicial campaign chair your former president, Susan Hammer. If it weren't for Susan, I wouldn't be here. This week, in our nation's highest court, 
all eyes were on judges, not so much on the Supreme Court justices themselves as on the thousands of elected state court judges in our country who preside over 95% of the nation's litigation, some 47.3 million cases per year, not including traffic violations. The case being argued, Caperton versus Massey, concerned judicial independence, specifically whether elected state court judges should be required to disqualify themselves from disputes involving big donors to their campaigns. Or as former Solicitor, Ted, Gen Solicitor General Ted Olson posed the question to the justices, would you want to be judged by someone who was selected with a $3 million subsidy by your opponent in the lawsuit? Legally speaking, does a judge's failure to disqualify him or herself from a case involving a major campaign contributor violate constitutional due process of law? We'll know the court's answer by July. And though it would be injudicious, uh, not to mention presumptuous of me to predict the outcome of that case, I can suggest that Caperton v. Massey is worthy of close attention. As alluded to by Olson's question, the facts of that case show that the CEO of the Massey Coal Company personally contributed $3 million to help a challenger unseat an incumbent West Virginia Supreme Court justice. Soon after the election, the successful challenger cast the deciding vote in the West Virginia court's decision to overturn a $50 million verdict in a fraud lawsuit in the Massey, uh, that the Massey Coal Company had lost to a fellow by the name of Caperton, the owner of a rival coal company. The West Virginia experience may seem far removed from Oregon, where the average campaign contribution in judicial races is about $100, and where the total amount of money spent by candidates in the most recent contested statewide general election race for a seat on the Oregon Supreme Court was just over half a million dollars, or one-sixth of a single contribution in West Virginia. In addition to the significantly smaller amounts of money they raised, the candidates in the Oregon race, Virginia Linder and Jack Roberts, voluntarily entered into an agreement to follow a set of remarkably high-minded campaign practices, and then, despite a high-profile, close race, managed to stick to them. However, just because judicial races in this state have not been hugely costly affairs, does not mean that we can assume things will remain that way. Judges are elected to office in 39 states, including Oregon. And according to an organization called Justice at Stake, which tracks campaign spending in judicial elections, candidates for the highest state courts have raised more than $168 million since the year 2000. Currently in Wisconsin, a state one might argue has more similarities to Oregon than West Virginia, the Chief Justice of that state's Supreme Court has raised more than $1 million to spend in this spring's election. Buying justice, as is alleged in the Caperton case, is the most insidious face of the politicization of the judiciary. As the Honor Honorable Margaret Marshall of Massachusetts, head of the conference of Chief Justices, recently told the American Bar Association's House of Delegates, unprecedented amounts of special interest money now line judicial campaign coffers. Vicious and misleading judicial electioneering floods the media. She goes on to say this trio of developments, special interest money, attack ads, and the loosening of ethical strictures on judicial campaign speech has transformed the nature of judicial elections. Yet, especially in an economic downturn like the one we are now experiencing. State courts are where people go to have their disputes heard. These disputes concern the most basic elements of their lives, families and children, landlord-tenant disagreements, workers' compensation issues, business dealings, land use, probate law, and personal injuries and other alleged wrongs. Often what's at stake in these cases are questions of food and shelter and health care and physical safety. How could there possibly be anything more essential to dispensing fair and impartial justice, a term I prefer over the more lofty and sometimes misunderstood term judicial independence, than judges who are unbiased and open-minded about the issues that come before them? At the same time, can citizens trust judges to be fair and open-minded if they've been elected with large contributions from a few individuals or groups with clear interest in the outcome of those cases? 
Numerous studies have shown that even judges, as well as ordinary citizens, believe that campaign contributions, and not just $3 million contributions, influence judicial decisions. Well, I hope the Supreme Court will give us some helpful guidance on the interrelated subjects of due process and judicial bias when it decides Caperton. However, I say that with some degree of skepticism because, frankly, the U.S. Supreme Court's 2001 decision in a case called White versus Republican Party of Minnesota has opened a virtual Pandora's box, resulting in the loosening of campaign restrictions in many states. The White case found unconstitutional the so-called announce clause in Minnesota's judicial co uh, code. Until it was invalidated, that provision prevented judicial candidates from announcing their views on disputed legal and political subjects during the course of a judicial campaign. I'm pleased to be able to tell you that here in Oregon, our judges have responded to the White case and anticipated the issue in the Massey case in several positive ways. First, by voluntarily and unanimously resolving two years ago at our annual judicial conference to affirm our commitment to nonpartisan judicial elections and to fair and dignified judicial campaigns, including provisions restricting our acceptance of campaign contributions in certain circumstances. Second, a committee that I've been asked to chair by Oregon's Chief Justice is currently working to ensure that our ethics code meets the constitutional standards set by the court in white. We will be recommending that Oregon maintain and clarify our rule that makes it unethical to make pledges, promises, or commitments that are inconsistent with the impartial performance of the adjudicative duties of judicial office. Our committee and an ABA commission on which I served for three years agree that this prohibition is not inconsistent with white, and we've drafted a comment in our code that addresses the important distinction between this prohibition and the disfavored announce clause. In addition, our proposed revised code would acknowledge for the first time the changing role of judges as problem solvers, in particular in family court, drug court, and now mental health court. For example, proposed rules and comments pertaining to judges' conduct in such areas as ex parte communications with service providers, assisting and managing self-represented litigants, judicial support of pro bono legal services programs, judicial settlement and mediation, all reflect support for the new order in the court that is the theme of today's forum. Also for the first time ever, the code would feature access to justice as a core value. I serve on a court of which I am very proud. The 10 judges on the Court of Appeals work hard, handling approximately 4,000 cases a year, writing full published opinions in over 400 of them. We try our best with the resources that we have to provide a quality product, all the while meeting statutory deadlines for certain categories of cases, such as juvenile dependency and termination and land use cases. Our judicial settlement program is a national model and resolves fully 25% of the civil appeals that are filed, saving countless amounts of time and effort for litigants, lawyers, and judges. To attempt to measure the quality of our work, we've adopted performance measures to evaluate how we're doing in three areas, quality of our product, timeliness and efficiency, and public trust and confidence, what we call our success factors. We have surveyed appellate lawyers who appeared before us, as well as trial judges whose rulings we considered on appeal. We've implemented a case management system and hope to implement e-filing very soon, all in the interests of maintaining an open and accessible court system. The judges will, be, will all be at work on Fridays, and we hope this period of court closures, as it was in 2003, will be short-lived. The one thing I will leave you with is this. Each of the three branches of government has an important and complementary but distinct role to play in our government in these challenging times. I am confident that our Chief Justice and the Judicial Department staff are doing everything possible, working together with the legislative branch to minimize the harms to our staff and court programs while doing our part to contribute to the necessary cost reductions. I also want to acknowledge my colleagues, Judges Maurer and Waller, and of course Judge Wyatt, who invited us to appear together today. I miss my Multnomah colleagues and my respect for them has only increased since leaving them four years ago to head to Salem. Thank you very much for having us.
Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here in front of the City Club, and I want to thank the membership for asking us to be here. I also want to thank my colleague, Judge Mary Souther Wyatt, for helping to arrange for today. I didn't know, frankly, when I arrived that I would actually match the color scheme, and so I'm also grateful for that. Um, it's interesting. I've been the presiding judge now for a year in Multnomah County. And I had hoped when I undertook this job that it would be interesting, and I can assure you that it has been. Um, but I must admit, the other day when I received an email from a friend with a twist on the proverb, may you not live in such interesting times, that sentiment resonated for me. The last several days, as you know, and the last several weeks have been filled with the news of the economic crisis and its effect on the judicial system. Court closures, staff pay cuts, threats of backlogged cases fill the news. And as I thought about my remarks today, I thought about what that will mean for the courts and how to approach it best in speaking to this group and to the broader audience that is listening by radio and watching on television. And so it occurred to me that before we can understand what we might lose, we first have to understand what we have. And so I want to spend a few minutes describing our court. Ours is a court that is uh, remarkable and it is remarkable in one respect that I want to talk about immediately. This topic was captured as Oregon's changing judiciary. And of course, that has many, many meanings. But perhaps the most obvious is that which you see when you arrive. So let me tell you what I mean by that. We have 38 elected judges in Multnomah County and I'm pleased to announce that fully one half are women. And I'm also pleased to announce that the leadership of our court is entirely women. It's a, a pretty remarkable um, event in our state's history and in our county's history. When I started uh, practicing law in 1974, there were very few women in the legal community and on the bench. In fact, in Multnomah County, there was only one woman judge, Judge Jean Lewis. And it would be another 12 years in 1973 before she was join, joined by another woman judge, Judge Mercedes Diaz, our first African-American judge in Oregon. There are now an equal number of men and women serving as elected judges. And I want to comment on the names of the women who serve in leadership roles. We have, and I'm sure many of you know them, Judge Julie France, who has served as our chief criminal judge for many years. Judge Nan Waller, my colleague here to my right, our chief family law judge. Judge Christina Lamar, who serves as our chief uh, um, appropriate uh, dispute resolution judge. Judge Catherine Tennyson, who serves as our probate judge, our chief probate judge. And Judge Janice Wilson, who serves as our chair of our motion panel. What this tells you and tells me every day when I work is that our court has embraced one of the first principles of justice, which is equality. And it is with great pleasure that I come to work every day to work with these remarkable judges. All of our judges and our 12 referees who serve in our courts are hardworking problem solvers, which is um, actually a very good thing because of the um, immense caseload that we have. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. When I was growing up, um, I had a nickname in my family, and it was called Swift and Sure. And I don't know from what that derived. I think my brothers could probably uh, weigh in on that. But in any event, I have found that that has served me well in this year. 
And that is because we have 425,000 cases that go through the Multnomah County Court every year. It is approximately 1,700 cases a day. The cases include, among many other things, parking tickets, traffic violations, small claims, landlord and tenant, complex personal injury and commercial litigation, and criminal cases which range from low-level misdemeanors to aggravated murder cases with a possible sentence of death. I want to give you some more numbers. We have five court locations in Multnomah County. Some of you may have been in them. The most uh, familiar to many of you may be the one in downtown Portland, which is the Multnomah County Courthouse. We also have, however, the Juvenile Justice Center, the Gresham Annex, the Adult Justice Center, which is across the street uh, from the downtown courthouse, and the Judicial Dispute Resolution Center, which is next door to us in the uh, Portland building, which is where Judge Christina Lamar has labored for years helping bring resolution to cases that are proceeding through our courts in civil and in family law matters. The Circuit Court of Multnomah County differs from that of other counties as well because we are the municipal court for both Portland and for Gresham, the largest and the fourth largest cities in Oregon. We have a statewide caseload for example, in Multnomah County are filed 47% of the personal injury and medical malpractice cases in the state, one-third of the wrongful death cases, and nearly one-quarter of the contract actions. At the same time, because of case management systems that we have and because of the work of the judicial officers, out of the 425 cases, 425,000 cases that we have annually, we were able last year to close 412,000 cases, almost 1,600 a day. That doesn't happen easily. It happens because there are systems in place which um, make our court an efficient one. And we are one of the most efficient metropolitan courts in the nation. It's easy to forget, though, when you're looking at a court and you look at the headline grabbers, the big cases, that there are cases that matter to people every day in the small claims section of our court. These are cases where people come in unrepresented, the dollar amounts are not high. However, those cases matter a lot to each of the people. And last year, it fell to one judicial role to f uh, manage 15,000 of those cases. The court continues, as I say, to be a national leader in many respects, including innovative programs for the management of criminal actions and the rehabilitation of defendants with alcohol and drug abuse problems. Known as problem-solving courts, we have the DUI Intensive Supervision Court. We have as well what we call our STOP Court, which is our drug court. We have a mental health court. Last year, we had 137 people graduate from that STOP Court. And I want you to know that our DUI Intensive Supervision Court has received two national awards. We have 30,000 jurors who serve on cases every year in our court, and 136,000 who responded to summons. Ours is an old courthouse, and it is now approaching 100 years. I would like to uh, tell you that we have 600,000 people who come through its doors every day, or every year sometimes feels like every day. <laughs> and I want to invite all of you to come down. Everywhere I go, I ask people to come. I want you to come in the context of something other than a lawyer or a party. I want you to come down and see me and let me talk to you about the work that we do and to help you understand what the cuts that we are facing will mean. Thank you.
thank you to the City Club and to my colleague and friend Judge Wyatt for giving us this opportunity to address you all about <clears throat> the new order in the court. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own um, journey to the bench because I think that it illustrates how the new order in the court has changed the work of the court. There are moments in all of our lives that are of such significance that we hold them in complete visual clarity in our memory. The first time it was suggested to me that I could become a judge was one of those moments. I can still remember standing in my parents' kitchen at age 27, my cheeks burning, not because I felt that they were uh, recognizing my strengths and talents as a lawyer, uh, I was two years out of law school at the time, but because I thought that they were, that was so audacious for them to suggest that I could be a judge. Because in my mind's eye, at age 27, a judge was a white-haired, black-robed man sitting on a bench calling the balls and strikes in the drama that was playing out before him. Um, luckily for me, the role of a judge has changed. And as you've heard, part of that is the picture of who is a judge has changed as more women have risen to the bench. But there's another change that is also fundamental to why becoming a judge really became of interest to me. And that is the role of a judge is no longer simply the decider of those matters that come before the court, which is the traditional role, but the role has also changed to the non-traditional role of community convener, of problem solver, of leader of community efforts to make things better for those who come before the court as we try to resolve problems. Um, and it was really when I started practicing in juvenile court and then became a referee that I saw myself as, uh, I saw the bench as something that I should uh, aim for. In probably no other part of the court than juvenile court is that role, the non-traditional role of judge, more apparent. Juvenile courts are the original problem-solving courts in this country. Uh, in 1904, the first juvenile court in Oregon was created by the legislature. It was here in Multnomah County. Um, and at the time, one of the proponents of the uh, creation of a juvenile court noted that it is less costly and wiser to save a child than to punish a criminal. And that has been the underpinnings of juvenile court ever since. That we have an obligation for the children and families who come before the court to resolve the issues to make things better. Clearly the nature of juvenile court work leads to the need to get off the bench and into the community to try to make things work better for families and children. We have responsibility in juvenile court for children who are removed and placed into foster care. We are under federal mandates and state mandates by law to try to swiftly uh, resolve the issues to return children to parents if at all possible, and if not, then to assure that they have a permanent placement within a reasonable period of time. When uh, resolution of the case cannot be completed by return of children to the care of parents, then we move to the very serious action of termination of their parental rights. We have responsibility for young children charged with uh, criminal activity, with delinquency matters, and we have, by statute, the responsibility of making sure that we not only hold youth accountable, but assure that they have the opportunity for reformation. Likewise, in our family court, we have families coming before the court with serious issues of discord, and we have an obligation to assure that the children who are parts of those families do not suffer more than necessary as we quickly resolve cases, assure family security, and assure that children have the opportunity to have meaningful contact with both parents so long as that is safe. Um, there are numerous examples in our juvenile court of the, both the traditional role of judges, the decider of cases that come before the court, and of judges as champions of collaboration. Um, 16 years ago, we began in Multnomah County a detention reform effort that in part uh, led to the 
building that we now use as our juvenile court building. Um, and we, we did that because we needed to assure the Board of County Commissioners that we were able to successfully manage and not grow our detention population, thereby needing more space for a detention facility. Um, through collaboration of many community partners, the court, uh, the Department of Community Justice, law enforcement, private providers, and the Annie E. Casey Foundation, we have had a very successful um, initiative where we have safely uh, sorted who should be in detention and who should not be in detention, and use detention for those who provide the greatest risk to the community or have the greatest failure of uh, potentially not coming back to court when they should on our delinquency side of the court. Uh, we have had the um, experience of being able through that detention reform of correctly and objectively sorting who should and should not be in detention to be one of the few places in the country where we have had some success in reducing overrepresentation in our delinquency system which is clearly a cornerstone of any system of justice, that all who come before the court have the same opportunity uh, for uh, equal outcomes. Early, um, a number of years ago, when we looked at what were the barriers to swift return of children to the care of parents, we realized that the majority of our parent population suffer from substance abuse issues, and that the delay of the parent coming to court after their children were removed and their uh, awakening to the fact that they needed to resolve the substance abuse issues, that we were losing time, oftentimes months. Literally, a parent would come to court on the day of removal of the child at a preliminary hearing, walk out of the courtroom, and as a judge, I would see them crumbling the order that directed them as to the next steps of their life in their despair and their trauma. And sometimes they would do what addicts often do, which is they would address their trauma and despair by going out and using, and we would lose them for a period of time. The caseworkers would, rather than be getting them into treatment, would be searching for them. Um, clearly, that was not a good use of resource. We wasted a lot of time. Um, by law, we are supposed to be working towards getting children into a permanent placement, either home or into the highest form of permanency, and hopefully that is adoption if they can't safely return home within one year's time. So in juvenile court, every minute matters. We resolve that by meeting again with our community partners and through the agreements with the Department of Human Services, through county uh, drug and alcohol, through private providers, volunteers of America, we located at the juvenile court a drug and alcohol evaluator and someone who would assist parents in getting quickly to uh, treatment once they were uh, identified as having a problem. Now when a parent comes into court on day one, if they choose to, because it is pre-adjudication, they can set up an appointment immediately with a drug and alcohol uh, evaluator located in the courthouse and then be guided through the next steps. We realize that sometimes it is the little things that get in the way of progress on the part of a parent. They don't have the TB test to get into treatment. They need a physical. They can't get up in the morning by themselves. So with one of our partners in the community, we have outreach workers who take on some of those very nuts and bolts tasks of assisting parents. We have been able to greatly reduce the number of days it takes to get par parents who come before the court into treatment. And as a result, we have been able to um, have children return to parents on a much more timely basis. Um, the good work of the family involvement team under the uh, planner who works with the court, Martha Strawn Morris, led to rec the recognition of the federal government in 2007 when we received a very sizable um, grant in order to bring the, uh, the, it up to scale. Um, we realized that children with significant mental health problems were creating a frustration to every single system that they uh, came into contact with. In schools, they were not doing well and they would often be kicked out. They would end up in uh, child welfare and foster care sometimes and would go from home to home to home to home. Um, they would not be able to develop therapeutic relationships because they were literally a rolling stone. 
Six years ago, a group of us came together and realized that this was not a good use of resources and that the outcomes for these children were abysmal. We would have some children who'd been in 40 foster homes, multiple schools, in and out of residential care, hospitals, and detention. And at the end of the day, after all of that disruption, we can all see what the results for a child would be. And the road for those children, too often than not, would be straight into, as they matured, into the adult criminal justice system. Um, <clears throat> we have a, all of those partners joined together. We now have a wraparound uh, model of providing uh, mental health service to services to children and their families. Again, our early evaluation is very positive and the state is now working towards a statewide wraparound. There is legislation currently pending before uh, the legislature to help promote this. Uh, we are seeing children have much better success, stabilizing placement, slowing down the number of moves that they have, keeping them in school, and keeping them out of our delinquency system. Uh, our current initiative is one where we are hoping to take on the uh, overrepresentation of minority children in our child welfare system. Uh, again, as a matter of equity, it is important for courts to be involved and take the lead in this. So my hope, um, in terms of the new order of the court, that we will, despite the budget cuts, despite how grim things are, that we will be able to keep up these innovative and collaborative efforts with judges leading the way. Because without that, I fear that we will go back to some of the terrible outcomes for children and families that we've seen uh, previously. So I hope that we are able to keep up this work. Um, we know that we end up with better outcomes for children and families. We have similar results in our child support uh, court and in uh, our facilitator, facilitated uh, family law program. Um, and I too welcome, you're all welcome to come out to juvenile court in Oregon. Juvenile court is public, they are open hearings, and I think that you would be astounded by the miraculous changes that you see in families and children as they resolve the issues. Thank you. The first question of our speakers today, as always, would be from our Board of Governors host. Our board host today is Sharon Van Sickle Robbins. Uh, Sharon Van Sickle Robbins operates a cut flower business with 20,000 peony plants on Savi Island. Sharon has been a City Club member since 1996. She chaired the club's executive director search committee last year, chaired the Portland Business Environment Research Study Committee that was approved here last fall. Currently is the organization's secretary and a member of the club's strategic planning committee. Sharon became a member of the Board of Governors in 2007. Sharon? Well, I could think of a lot of questions that I wanted to ask, but one of the things we talked about uh, up at the lunch table uh, before we started the speaking was in 2003 you all had the experience of furloughs in the in unfortunately not too distant past and I just wanted to know if you could talk to the audience about what you see as potentially different about the experience of going into those furloughs this time around. Um, I'd be happy to take a first run at that. I was told to keep my mouth really close to the mic but the mic has a really short cord. So um, in any event, here's what I would say is the primary difference. In uh, 2003, it is true that we had to have furloughs. However, at that time, the furloughs were um, less onerous. The staff took a 10% cut rather than the 20% cut that they have now had to experience. Moreover, there was hope on the horizon it looked as though things were going to turn around. And while I am at my core an optimist, and I always want to believe that the future holds something um, positive, I do have some concerns as I read the papers and I see what is on the internet, that we may not see the rebound that we did uh, in 2003. The other difference, primary difference, is that in 2003, the indigent defense services uh, that are provided for all people who cannot afford counsel in criminal cases 
were uh, insufficiently funded at that time to be able to continue to provide representation to people. And so we had to delay some of the criminal cases until after the beginning of the next biennium. While that was a terrible thing in some ways, it did allow us to go forward with some other cases. And uh, this time, the good news is that there is sufficient funding for individuals who uh, need counsel in criminal cases, but it means that those cases will continue to move right through the system in a timely way, and others will have to take a back seat. Thanks. I, I think there's also another fundamental difference in that the cuts that all of our partners that make up our justice system are taking also unprecedented cuts in their budgets, and we're not sure yet how that will all play out but we anticipate significant cuts in the district attorney's office, in community justice, um, a decimation of residential treatment beds, which will clearly have a tremendous impact on the work of many parts of the court, um, and so on. And so I, I, I think that that is going to be very different because that will impact, quite frankly, um, the ability of our orders to be carried out for us to have uh, uh, options and alternatives uh, for the people who come before the court. I'd just like to add that um, statistically, uh, the Judicial Department budget is almost 90% personal services, that is staff costs, and closer to 95% in the trial courts. That is something that has not changed, and that is the primary reason why furloughs are what is uh, considered to be the best way to approach this problem rather than, t hopefully temporary problem, rather than cutting back on the programming that you've heard about, much of you've heard about today. Uh, we will now take questions from the floor. Uh, asking questions uh, at Friday forums is a privilege of City Club membership. We ask that uh, when you ask your question, you identify yourself as a member, keep your question to 30 seconds or less. Uh, do ask a question instead of make a speech, and uh, in this case, you can address your question to one or more members of the panel, and remember, Susan Hammer, you're talking to judges when you ask your question. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for that reminder. Um, first, I just wanted to say um, how thrilling it is uh, for me to see you all up there. I started passing law about the same time you did, and I really uh, am thrilled that some of our best professionals have emerged as leaders in the court, and um, I want to thank you all for your public service. My question is this. There's been a proposal floated for years about the, uh, a new uh, courthouse for Multnomah County, and the last survey I saw showed that something less than 20% of the public supported this. Um, my question is, and I think probably Jean Maurer is the first, Judge Maurer is the first person I direct this to, but why do we need a new courthouse? Why can't we just make do with what we have? Um, and what, what is the reason why this should take a priority for public support? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, because it brings up another thing I failed to mention. Anyone who wants a tour of the courthouse, um, we actually are providing that. And so I would, in addition to encouraging you to come down, and I say this to anyone and everyone, we will provide you with an opportunity to go on a tour. And you'll be able to see when you go on that tour uh, the answer to the question. Here is the situation about the Multnomah County Courthouse. As I indicated, it was completed in 1914, and at that time it had about 17 courtrooms. Now it has to house all of the judges and the referees. It is seismically a very dangerous building. The problem with the construction in part, and I actually keep a brick in my chambers so you can see that when you come by, it is unreinforced uh, terracotta brick. It has no uh, rebar, it has nothing in it that will help to hold it in the event of a seismic event. We also have HVAC systems that are deteriorating, as you might imagine. It is costly to maintain. It's not an efficient building. And it is unsafe in one of the primary reasons that courthouses of that era are unsafe. There are not three corridors 
to allow judges, staff, then public, and then inmates to travel. So I was in an elevator not too long ago because our jail elevator had broken, which it does frequently. Um, they had to actually send for parts to be forged. I think it was in the south somewhere because they don't make them anymore. And I was in the elevator and there was a young mother with a child. I think she was there to seek a, a restraining order for um, abuse. The, there was a corrections deputy, there was an inmate with his handcuffs on, and then there were several other people in the elevator as well. And I remember thinking, this is just not a good idea. And although the person who was in custody was a very nice guy and talked to the baby and that was all good, I just thought it, it's not appropriate. So there are many reasons, and those are only a few. And if I just might add, I lived in that building for 16 years before going to Salem. That's one aspect of it I don't miss. I used to worry about that quite a bit, particularly uh, several times. Once when I was picking a jury, I had about 40 jurors in my courtroom during an earthquake that lasted, it seemed like a very, very long time. You'll all remember that one from that spring break few years back. Uh, and then a few years later, when we were celebrating Take Your Daughters and Sons to Work Day, we had 200 children in the building during an earthquake. Uh, thankfully, it was a small one, but nevertheless, it was frightening. Uh, in 1991, the city commissioned a study. Three buildings were determined to be the most dangerous buildings in Portland. Those were the library, the city hall, and the courthouse. Two out of three have been fixed. You can't fix the Multnomah County Courthouse. It has to be replaced. John Leeper, City Club member. My question concerns the statewide judicial system. In certain counties in the state, the head of the Board of County Commissioners is also designated as a judge to hear certain kinds of trials and cases. A matter of continuous concern and ignorance on my part is, I don't know what their qualifications are because some of these people are attorneys, others are not. And I just wonder really what they get in the way of training before they do hear these cases. I, I probably can't give you a complete answer, but I know that there are, um, and I can't remember quite frankly the term, Justice of the Peace, Justice of the Peace or that's not, county judges in some counties who hear juvenile matters. Every summer we have a juvenile judges annual training. We invite the county judges to our training to address the issue that you are uh, talking about to make sure that they have adequate training and um, I, I think that that's I don't have a great deal of familiarity with county judges other than that yes I was going to say sir I don't know either as as particularly as I should what the uh, requirements are for their qualifications but I did participate one time in a uh, judicial training seminar and several of those in, uh, people came uh, because it was important for them in their communities to understand some basic concepts that are related to the um, search and seizure laws that govern uh, decisions that they will be making. And I know that's not a good answer for you because it doesn't speak to what is required of them by way of um, qualifications, but I can attest to the fact that they were interested in the topic. And it is a statutory uh, type of judge in the state, it's sort of a unique one because they're actually uh, more political. They're allowed to engage in political activity unlike us, for example, except of course to get elected, but that's, as I indicated earlier, a little different type. Uh, but I do know that um, our Chief Justice and our um, various other court leaders are doing everything we can to train non-lawyer judges in the state, such as justices of the peace, who also can serve without having law degrees. And we're doing uh, probably an okay job, but not as good as we could. Uh, Kurt Wabring, member. Um, the City Club has done a, a research report on early childhood 
and uh, I'm sure that you, in one way or another, know about some of the importance of the first five years, which basically is uh, mental development and emotional development are um, formed in that time. And um, so I'm wondering, in your work that you're doing, how you try to respond to that kind of uh, information and maintain families uh, uh, and build them that are healthy. In, we are in Multnomah County, a one family, one judge court. So the moment a family comes before the juvenile court, that, that judge is the judge of the case until resolution, which allows a great deal of continuity uh, of planning um, of the case. As I indicated before, every summer we have an annual training of juvenile court judges. We've had experts come talk about the importance of the zero to three uh, time period. We've had uh, Judge Lieberman from Florida come talk to us. It is something that we are very interested in as a uh, initiative. I've been talking to the Children's Relief Nurseries about how we can get more um, of our families to the relief nurseries because of that importance of the dyad work that needs to be done. Joella Whirling Club member, it occurs to me with respect to Susan Hammer's question that maybe we could have a combination Multnomah County Courthouse and Soccer Stadium. Uh, I, uh, my question is for Judge Waller. Um, is Say what exactly is the uh, numerical age of cutoff for juvenile, and does that age number really um, seem the appropriate measure for determining who gets judged as a juvenile? Thank you. Um, for on delinquency cases, jurisdiction uh, continues, or matters can be heard by the court so long as the uh, child was 18. Um, prior to the filing of the petition. On the dependency side of the court, we can maintain jurisdiction over children until age 21. We certainly know from all of the teenage brain research that children are not fully grown often at age 18, and on an average, continue to rely upon the support of an adult until their mid-20s. Uh, so we have been doing everything we can to make sure that before children are, before we terminate the court's involvement in the involvement of child welfare, that we have a good plan for transition into adulthood. Um, and for many of our children who are in foster care uh, until they are, are uh, an adult, uh, we do maintain them in foster care until age 21 so that we can maintain that support um, that they need. We always try to have a final plan for them that will assure that there is uh, adult support, financial security, uh, health insurance. Um, there, we do have a measure 11, as you're all aware, uh, allows for the direct filing for certain serious person-to-person um, -person crimes at age 15. Uh, those cases are filed in adult, in adult court and, the, and adjudicated as adults. I don't know if that answered the end of the question. Okay. Steve Novick, City Club member. Your Honors, I believe that one of the reasons for the underfunding of many public services, including courts, is that voters literally don't draw the connection between the taxes they pay and the public services they value. I would ask if the three of you would be willing to sign my petition to Dick Wolf of Law and Order, asking him to change the introduction of the show to say, in the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate but equally important groups. The prosecutors, I'm sorry, the police, city employees whose salaries are largely paid by property taxes, and prosecutors, county employees, whose salaries are also largely paid by property taxes, these are their stories. Would you sign that petition? I think we'll have to get an ethics advisory opinion before we can tell you how we would uh, answer your question, uh, Mr. Novick, but it's a very uh, intriguing one. We've run out of time and need to stop there. Uh, uh, join us next uh, Friday here at Friday Forum for Dr. Mary King from PSU. Again, we'll talk about a sustainable New Deal. Uh, don't forget to consider buying a book for the Citizens Read Book Club from Cynthia in the back of the room. And as we close, please join me in expressing our appreciation to today's speakers. I trust 
All in the room are feeling like uh, these are at least three courts who are in very good hands. The Honorable Judges Ellen Rosenblum, Jean Maurer, and Nan Waller. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>